This program is brought to you by the Gulf of Mexico Foundation with support from Shell. The United States has been extracting oil and gas from the Gulf of Mexico for more than half a century for the energy needed to fuel the nation's economy. The first platform was set in place off the coast of Louisiana in 1947, and by 1990, there were 4,000 of them. A purely unintended consequence has been the creation of artificial reef habitats that are of huge environmental and economic value. Globally, corals are a threatened species, and the natural reef habitats they form are under stress. In contrast, these artificial reefs in the Gulf of Mexico are thriving. They are literally towers of life. This is Dr. Clinton Duncan of the Gulf of Mexico Foundation, and welcome to my playroom. The life sources here are just incredible. Sponges, hydroids, fishes of every description. And this is right here off the Texas coast. It is truly a cornucopia of life. Over the next week, we will be visiting artificial reefs, natural reefs, bringing this all to you so you can see what exists out here. This is all brought to you courtesy of a group from Michelle. And hopefully you'll enjoy my playroom as much as I do. These man-made structures mimic the highly productive marine ecosystems that occur on natural reefs like the Flower Gardens and Stetson Bank. These natural reefs have been described as the rainforest of the oceans because of their incredible biological diversity. Dozens of these natural banks are scattered along the continental shelf of the Gulf and they all teem with life. So here we are on Stetson Bank. Lion cell mount copies. We're about 65 miles off of the Texas coast. Stetson Bank is part of the Flower Garden Bank Sanctuary. Sanctuary. Now we're about 35 feet deep. And this is a really dynamic habitat. It's high energy, high energy, wave energy, sunlight. You know, a reef like this, because of its shallow water nature, heavily impacted by the storms, the hurricanes that come through this area fairly regularly. The sediment and rock layers with all of this area really erupted through the surface tens of thousands of years ago. You really see the geological uplifting of the limestone layers. It almost looks like somebody's heart. Well, I've been diving the flower garden for many, many years, but I'm always amazed when I come back at, at what you see. Out here in the middle of the Gulf, 100 miles offshore, is one of the real natural wonders of, uh, of the uh, whole North America. This is the healthiest coral reef in the Northern Atlantic, healthier than the Caribbean reefs or in any others, and so it's very special. While the natural reefs and banks in the Gulf of Mexico are highly productive habitat, they're separated by vast stretches of mud and sand that are virtually undersea deserts. But over the past 60 years, as we've installed platforms to extract the Gulf's oil and gas reserves, we have created these towers of life, where before there was nothing but empty bottom. Right now, there are about 3,000 of these structures in the Gulf of Mexico producing all this biological biomass, biodiversity. It's an incredible resource. The platform jackets provide hard substrate that is quickly colonized by a variety of marine organisms. They include bacteria and algae, attached invertebrates like barnacles, mollusks, sponges, and hydroids. They in turn attract small fish, which then attract larger fish. With these reef structures, they capture, collect, and magnify 
energy and nutrients is in through reproduction and the food web. They export energy and nutrients. That's a classic uh, description of an artificial reef or a natural reef. Capture, magnify, and export. Like a natural reef, these habitats collect energy and nutrients from sunlight and from tissue of organisms attracted by the reef. These artificial ecosystems then take these building blocks of life, diversify and magnify them through habitat growth and reproduction. Then this accumulation of energy is exported to the broader ecosystem of the Gulf itself. And as long as these cycles are left uninterrupted, they are like perpetual motion machines. Now, and then we look and we see all of this algae. Again, this is a, looks like a red algae. And beneath all of this, there are bivalves, mollusks. And you can see it's opening and closing and moving. And I first saw these structures in about 1996. They were clean steel then, they were brand new. This platform was put here for the purpose of producing oil and gas. It was not put here to produce biological communities. So this is really a uh, uh, artifact unintended consequences. But it's amazing. I think when most people think about productivity, they think of fin fish only. Uh, and there is productivity in that area as well. But just you know, considering that the guys who design offshore platforms design them with the plan that there's going to be a four to six inch fouling layer, growth layer around the legs of that platform, right? Those growths are productivity, right? They're taking biomass from the water column. The vast majority of those are filter feeders and they're taking that energy and using it to fuel their own growth. And of course that attracts other, kind of creates an environment for other species to come in. And even fish, whether fish are actually, you know, recruited as a larvae to the artificial reefs or whether fishes are recruited as adults, once they're there, particularly species like red snapper, they have a, um, a, a high fidelity, which means that they, once they're on an artificial reef, they tend to stay there uh, for a very long time. And they're not just suspended in space there, they're actually feeding and growing, and, and that growth of those fishes is productivity as well. These artificial reefs greatly multiply the amount of useful habitat provided by the sparse number of natural reefs that dot the Gulf of Mexico's relatively barren seafloor. What's happened is the oil industry has grown in the Gulf of Mexico. They've created a, a whole other industry themselves, and that's uh, fishing, uh, sport fishing on the, uh, these platforms. And it's, it's literally a multi-billion dollar business. And so what we're trying to do with these rigs to reef programs is to transfer that economic benefit that comes from those productive rigs to the artificial rigs. We, we have to have those artificial rigs out there to sustain this industry. And everyone wants to do that. It's just, can we do it quickly enough not to lose that economic benefit? Red snapper is one of the economically valuable species of fish associated with offshore platforms. Dr. Bob Shipp, a professor with the Department of Marine Science at the University of Southern Alabama, has studied snapper populations in the Gulf since the 1970s. When we first started studying snapper about 20 or 30 years ago, the stocks were overfished. Uh, the, the projections for recovery were long-term, 30 or 40 years. But the projections didn't include uh, the artificial structure component. As the years went on, people began to realize that not only, not only uh, controlling fishing pressure, but also the increase in habitat work hand in hand to produce these much larger populations of snapper. Uh, 20 years ago, a charter boat fisherman or a private fisherman would go out and if he caught two or three snapper that weighed two or three pounds a piece, he f considered himself lucky. Now, the average snapper weight is over seven pounds. Uh, the bag limit is very small, two fish bag limit in a very short season. But nevertheless, these, this huge snapper population, not only in numbers of fish, but in the size of the fishes, approaches the, the virgin stocks of 150 years ago times 10. Looking at ways to increase the snapper fisheries is also one of the goals of the Hart Research Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. 
Well, the artificial reef um, and scientific questions revolving around artificial reefs drive our program greatly. We're um, very much interested in the role that these structures play, particularly as it relates to producing more fish in the Gulf of Mexico rather than attracting, and some of our research is actually showing that. So we're looking at not only artificial reefs, but also hard structures in the Gulf and sites that may become artificial reefs, really documenting what may be there before and hopefully after these reefs are created. These artificial reefs also support a thriving recreational diving industry Gulf-wide. Recreational diving is the biggest part of our business. We bring people out here, probably uh, uh, over a thousand people a year out here to enjoy the reefs. The platforms out here are just, uh, uh, from a diver's perspective, it just doesn't get any better than that. We have people that come, say, from all over the United States, from Canada, Alaska. We have people come down and the the Oil and gas platforms are such a unique structure. There are, I mean, the, the abundance of aquatics that are underneath these platforms, it, it's mind boggling. Oh my God, that was awesome. <laughs> you said there was a shark down there. <laughs> you didn't say it was a whale shark. <laughs> oh my God, I can't believe it. The whale sharks, for some reason, they love to interact with the platforms and we have seen this over and over. And people that have gone to the Caribbeans and all and have dove, then they come up here and they dive these platforms, they go, my God, I never thought that it was this much life or you could see this well out here in the Gulf. I got you a sight line from the old U-boat. You got two U-boats down there. Safety is a major concern when diving on offshore platforms. Extra precautions are necessary because of factors like strong currents, heavy swell action, boat traffic, and other inherent hazards. Because of that, dive plan reviews, including the divers and the boat captain, were mandatory on this expedition and should be on every platform dive. These teaming communities of marine life also provide excellent educational opportunities. Organizations like the Gulf of Mexico Foundation have programs that bring teachers out to dive on the platforms and they see these ecosystems firsthand. Then they take that experience and knowledge back to the classroom. We really got to motivate uh, the scientists of the future, uh, the kids that will replace David. We've got to motivate the teachers, uh, the kids that somebody will take to the East Point. So this is just an excellent opportunity uh, for us to do all of that. So you just really cannot replace the actual experience that you bring into the classroom. The kids love to hear about the real world experiences and that means so much more than just what's in a textbook. I think it adds an element of realism to the lessons that a teacher will give. It adds on a sense of like they've done it, they can show, you know, they can represent what they're showing. And, and it's not like you're reading it out of a textbook either. Yeah, I think it's important that teachers have, should have real world experiences of what they're teaching because there could be some things that you learn while you're doing these things, like say diving, so that um, you have little tidbits of information that you didn't have when you're using the textbook or the curriculum. The reefs out there are an incredible learning resource. Uh, I'm able to bring back real world experiences to my classroom to show them, uh, not just out of a textbook, but there is a picture of me underwater with the fish showing them and pointing out things to them that they just can't get from a textbook. Dr. David Hicks, the chairman of biological sciences at the University of Texas Brownsville, also took part in the Gulf of Mexico Foundation's week-long survey of natural and artificial reefs off the Texas coast. He says these platforms not only attract fish, they attract students. We've had a, um, a partnership with Texas Parks and Wildlife's uh, artificial reef program for you know five or six years now, and uh, and through that partnership, we've certainly been able to uh, you know create uh, scholarships and, and uh, research projects for students that allowed us to you know advertise nationwide and you know and bring students to this university that would otherwise you know not know that we even existed, because a lot of these. Uh, artificial reefs are fairly close to shore, then we're able to access them. Uh, and being a university that's located very close to the coast, uh, we have taken advantage of those over the years. And we generally do, you know, several thesis projects are actually involved, um, involving artificial reefs. So here you have, you know, these very hands-on oriented, you know, problem-solving uh, research projects for students. And, you know, and it's, and it's, 
you know, it's very attractive to students too to be able to go out and study study reefs as opposed to other things that they could do. So it's very, very popular. That sentiment is echoed by one of his former students, Edward Walk, who now teaches biological sciences at the high school level. Every time I go on a dive trip, I come back and I tell my kids about it and they just love it. I mean, it really sparks their interest. You know, uh, it really gets them interested in the science, not just the marine science, but in, in general, because I can pretty much relate anything we talk about in the classroom uh, to my diving trips, whether it's talking about physics or chemistry, and they like to hear the real life. You know, how can we use this in real life, the real life stories of going down there and, and being able to see these animals and see these creatures, you know, it just, it really sparks their interest, they love it. Yeah, it's, it's a very big deal, it's very impressive that, that we could actually, that he could actually go out, um, for a week or so and then come back the, the next week and show us all this different cool stuff, all these different things that we're, we're, we can't get exposed to yet, but he can, so he brings it back to the class and it helps us learn. Better education leads to better science to help manage these precious resources. It also helps build a sense of stewardship in the future generations who will manage these resources. These artificial reefs could play an important role in the future sustainability of the Gulf of Mexico and the quality of life for the people who live along its shores. It's a tantalizing opportunity, but one that could easily slip through our fingers. We're really at a phase where all of the platforms on the shelf are, are coming to the end of their production and we're seeing an escalating rate of removals. And my concern, you know, is, is an artificial reef, once these are taken out, we will never see them back in here again. Mm -hmm. They were put here for a specific purpose that paid for itself as oil and gas production. They're expensive, they're massive, and I just don't see that once they're gone, they'll ever come back. The policy of the U.S. Department of the Interior, which has jurisdiction over activities on the outer continental shelf, is that when an offshore oil or gas platform is no longer productive, the owner either has to remove it or obtain permission to convert it into an artificial reef in special areas designated by the government. The oil companies invest huge sums of money to produce oil and gas offshore, but once a platform is no longer productive, sitting idle, it can cost $250,000 a year to maintain it as required by federal regulation and companies are understandably anxious to shed those costs as quickly as possible. We do have to uh, abide by time limits and get these structures out of the water. We have to uh, get permits and, uh, and authorizations for alternative de decommissioning strategies like artificial reefing. So all of that factors in as well as cost, as well as liability into how we ultimately decide whether a platform is suitable for artificial reefing or not. There is a sort of an economical break point for the oil companies. Uh, at around 100 feet, it all of a sudden becomes semi-economical for them to participate in the program. The smaller the structure, the less economically viable it is to participate, whereas uh, larger structures become more viable. The best ecological solution would be to simply leave a platform in place, penetrating the sea surface. But that's not a viable option primarily because of safety considerations, as well as liability and cost issues. The first option, in the areas where federal regulations allow, the platform top sides are removed and then when the remaining structure is cleaned and certified to be environmentally safe, the upper portion of the platform jacket is cut off at the depth mandated by regulators and placed on the seafloor next to the remaining portion of the rig jacket. The second option is to detach the platform from the seafloor and then tow it to an area designated for artificial reefing once again after it's been cleaned and certified to be environmentally safe. The third option is complete removal, leaving nothing behind which destroys the existing reef habitat. They can't be just left there. The best alternative is to cut them off, roll them over, let them continue to function as an artificial structure, but beneath the surface, whatever Coast Guard regulations are in place, put them at that level and, and leave them there. Uh, so to a fisheries biologist or marine scientist, the options are very, very clear. Let's convert them, 
to permanent artificial reef structures. But in 2010, the Department of the Interior issued a directive that has become known as the Idle Iron Memorandum because it imposes strict deadlines on the removal of platforms that are no longer in production. For some parts of the Texas Gulf Coast, the situation seems to have reached a critical juncture. Companies began pulling their platforms out of the Gulf by the hundreds, with only a handful being converted to artificial reefs. Right now, under the idle iron policy, the government is, is requiring these, these oil and gas structures that are not in production anymore to be removed, and they're being removed at, a, at an accelerated rate. We have all these intergovernmental agencies that are now looking and they're talking for the first time about this, and if they're gonna do that, that's all well and good, but the problem is it takes time, and in the meantime, every day there's another structure being removed. And if we could get them just to stop for a little while till they figure out what they should be doing with them and try to address you know, the way they're reefed, we could save some habitat and we could save some structure and we could, we could literally save part of our way of life. Commercial fishermen who depend on the Gulf for their livelihoods have seen a definite impact as the tempo of platform removals has accelerated. We need to leave these reefs in place. Um, when you congregate them, you put a lot of pressure on that area of bottom for the food source for these fish. You can bring a lot of fish in, but if you can't feed them, then it's, it's useless. They're going to leave that area. They're going to look for another area to feed in. As catches diminish, prices go up, and seafood wholesalers have to scramble to provide the fresh seafood that retailers and customers demand. If we can't get more production out of the Gulf of Mexico and it's there and we have all the resources to do it. In 40 more years, will snap will be 50 and $60 a pound. I mean, it's already getting to a point where it's, it's for the average consumer, it's very expensive. I think the scope, the breadth of this problem is something that people don't seem to understand. Uh, when the snapper fishery started 150 years ago, the annual harvest was about two million pounds a year. Now it's up to 10 to 12 million pounds a year, and projections are that if we reach our full potential, we may be pushing 20 million pounds of snapper a year, something that would have been totally impossible without the introduction of artificial structures. But there often seems to be a lack of communication, and finding a way to coordinate the activities of the various stakeholders involved has been problematic. Communication has been a huge problem. And when we get them together, everyone agrees that, that we ought to be doing, doing this, but the question is how do you make that happen? We've got to figure out how to break down the bureaucracies and get everybody out of their stovepipe focus and looking at the big picture. So that's why this project that we're doing uh, this week, um, really trying to understand reef ecology, artificial reefs compared to natural reef systems, I think will go a long way in helping, un, you know, helping with the basic understanding of the science. And the situation so alarmed other Gulf stakeholders, they started putting pressure on state lawmakers to press federal regulators to work toward solutions that will retain these valuable assets. In November 2012, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement held the first in a series of public workshops to discuss these concerns. What's next, I think, is that uh, we work with these federal agencies in a, in a situation where we can speed up the process of, of permitting artificial reef sites. After feedback from the public meetings and data collected from all the stakeholders, Bessie announced the publication of the interim policy document. This document gives Gulf states greater flexibility in the planning and utilization of obsolete platform structures as artificial reefs, and it also allows extensions to regulatory decommission deadlines to pursue reefing permits. Bessie also plans to add staff to more expediently address reefing permits and now it also works with the other five federal agencies with oversight responsibilities to further speed up permit processing. This is really uh, not about saving money or not about uh, uh, really Bessie's mission, which is to uh, uh, ensure safety and environmental protection uh, from oil spills. This is about uh, the uh, ecosystem in the Gulf of Mexico.
Behind me, the Gulf of Mexico. This magnificent body of water has played a remarkable role in the history of the United States. These waves have been washing onto this beach for thousands of years. Over the last 75 years, the Gulf of Mexico has become home to the largest concentration of artificial reefs in the world, oil and gas production platforms. Today, we're in danger of losing these structures as an ecological component. They've come to the end of their lifespan as production platforms, and by law, they must be removed. We've been able to bring together all of the players, the resource managers, the scientists, the academicians, the platform owners, to discuss a strategy. How can we sustain and maintain these structures as a benefit to the natural and biological productivity of the Gulf of Mexico? This program is brought to you by the Gulf of Mexico Foundation with support from Shell.